in contact with it, whether that hit home. And the reason why I'm saying this is because when you love something and when you're in love with something, because there's a difference between loving someone and being in love with someone. When we have a passion for a thing, all the hardships, all the difficulties, all the bumps and the rolls, the nicks and knots and lumps that you get on your head, there's no doubt they become easy and simple because you love that thing so much. And as the Arabs, they say the famous proverb, They say your love for a thing causes you to be deaf and blind. When you love something, when you have a passion for something, an ardent passion, that lies no doubt, you don't look at the other things, you don't look at the flaws and the faults and the hardships and the difficulties. And if you don't believe this, then look at when a person accepts Islam. Perhaps many of you don't know about this. Whereas most of you, if not all of you, were born and raised in Islam. Just as I was born and raised in Islam. But there lies no doubt, my background is much different than your background from Minnesota and from Philadelphia and from a long lineage of Muslims, imam, imams and scholars and righteous mujahideen and leaders of a Muslim country are not like those who have parents, who have grandparents, who have great grandparents that were Christians, some of them may have been Muslims, etc. It's not the same. So therefore, Umar I know he said, and I don't say this in a derogatory sense, but the reality has to be stated. He says, He says, the thing that will destroy Islam, the thing that will decompose and break down Islam, link by link, piece by piece, is when there's a youth who grows up who doesn't know about Jahiliya. All he knows is light. All he knows is khair. All he knows is Islam. He doesn't know the opposite side. So the point that I'm trying to get to is what? Is that when you love a thing, when you have a passion for a thing, when a person accepts Islam, and the Iman penetrates his or her heart for the first time, well, Allah, you can tell them to jump off a cliff. You can tell them that as a Muslim, you've accepted Islam, you've made your shahada, go take your ghusl, now you have to go commit suicide, jump off a bridge. Most people who accepted Islam from the, from the beginning like this, most of them, they would do it because of that first taste of Iman. That pure, unadulterated love of Iman, they're blind of all other realities. As for a Muslim for five years, 10 years, his whole life, he says, no way I'm jumping off a bridge. Like, I don't have to do that. Even if you brought him proven evidence, they didn't have to do that. So the point that I'm trying to get to is, is that we have a love for a thing and a passion for a thing, it blinds you. So me personally, alhamdulillah, in my short lifetime, I went through many things, many trials, many tribulations, but if I had the opportunity to do them again, and to suffer, and to starve, and to be cold in the winter, and hot in the summer, and sacrifice for years out of my life, if I had the opportunity to do it again, in most cases, I would do it again, without any second hesitation. And I'm sure the Mashaikh, they can say the same thing. Is this not the case? All of the struggles that we went through in Medina, only Allah knows. How many times, me and Abu Anas, huh? we didn't have food. This is not a reality, or are we making this up in front of the people? Well, Allah, I think, sometimes you don't have food. Sometimes you don't have money. We gather our money, we put our money together, and says, what are we eating tonight? Did the brother put the money on the Abu Rahim put the money in your account? No, he didn't put it yet. Right? We're eating bread and yogurt again. Beans, uh, food, tamis, or whatever the case may be. Well, Allah, I think, without any exaggeration. And if I had the opportunity to go back and to do it again, most cases I would. So the point that I'm trying to get to is, I can't really think of too many hardships or challenges that were that serious, that were a major fitna for me. Alhamdulillah, I spent maybe over 11 years out of my life living in the lands of the Muslims overseas, traveling, studying from different countries, etc. And I went through many things, I saw many things, I encountered countless faces, and all types of fitting that I've been through. Personal fitna, fitna with family, fitna with money. Uh, one of the biggest fitting, or not fitting, but trials is probably, growing up and maturing in ilm. You start off with something, you start off a part of something, and you see the reality of that thing. And you grow and you learn more, and you leave that thing, and you go into the next stage, or as we say, you go into the next chamber. I would say that 
despite all of these different trials and tribulations, it wasn't a thing that was that big or that challenging to me. And the reason because, or the reason is, is that when Allah hamd, is that I had a great deal of love for ilm. And I quote, this is not for me bragging and boasting, but perhaps this is a means of me trying to be thankful to Allah, and most importantly to encourage and to inspire the shabab. And wallah al the years that we've spent in Medina, and there are many people who spent more years in Medina than me, but the years that I spent there, 10 years, a decade out of my life, we've seen countless people come and go from America, from the UK, from Australia, from South America, from Central America, all different types of Western countries or Westernized countries. And when I first got there in 2002, and when I just left in 2015, well, it's like night and day. And I'm young myself. When we see many of the young Tulabra, it makes us feel old and outdated. It makes us feel like we're an endangered species. Because when we got to Medina, the students are nothing like how they are today. And the biggest thing, the biggest fault that I find among the young students, the upcoming junior students, the biggest problem is da'ful himma, is low aspirations, weak aspirations. They don't want to be anything. The average student, he comes, he's mediocre, lackluster. What do you want to be? What do you want to do? Inshallah, I want to study. Uh, maybe Sharia, put it to Sharia, put it to Da'wah, put it to Hadith, it's too hard, it's too difficult. Maybe I go home, get a degree in biology, etc. But many students of the past, people that we used to look up to, they had a taste, they had a thirst for it. They wanted to do something, they wanted to be something. So the point that I'm trying to get to is, perhaps it's our fault. Maybe the younger students lack inspiration. Maybe they lack encouragement from us, people that were there for years. So what I want to do with the next final Ta'ala, by Allah's permission, is try to make an example, a living example of how you should go and study and how the only thing that should be on your mind if you want to study the deen of Islam is the deen of Islam. If you want to go overseas and study Islam, that should be your life, the beginning and the end. You should eat, you should sleep, you should drink, and talab al -ilm. And a commonly asked question is, they say, yeah, Sheikh, yeah, Mufti, how many hours out of the day should I study? How many hours out of the day should I read? How many years should I go and travel? What should I study first? And we say to them, there's no such thing as this question. There is no such thing as study time for a real student of knowledge, for a part-time student of knowledge, a quote-unquote fake phony student of knowledge, an imposter, then he has study time, two hours out of the day, an hour out of the day, three hours out of the day. But someone who's hardcore, and that's how we want the Shabbat to be, there's no such thing as study time. There's time to eat, time to rest, time for recreation, time for speaking to your family, and every single minute and hour besides that has to be devoted to your studies. You make time for the other things and your life is supposed to be surrounded, based upon, resting upon the enemy. But most people today, unfortunately, especially from America, they go overseas and they have a totally different philosophy, totally different mindset. They have in their minds, business, money, marriage, imam job, then the enemy. Visiting my friends, playing basketball, I work out at the gym, then I go study. And then lies no doubt, that is not correct. So therefore, yeah, I need in these few brief moments in my humble base life, what I want to do in the next panel with Tyler is try to give back. Because Allah Alim, I remember when I was like these youth sitting in the masjid, listening to a lecture. Allah Alim, I remember like it was yesterday. I used to work in the barbershop. And before I started cutting here, before I got my own chair, I used to clean up in the barbershop. And I would see the brothers walk down the streets with their thobes on their kufis on, they had their pins in their pockets, they had their thobes, they had beards, their pants, their ankles, or above their ankles, and I would sit back and say, I want to be like them. Well, Lord, that's what I want to be like. And I remember the first time when I encountered someone who came from the Islamic University of Medina, how he looked, his charisma, his charm, it was like magic. And I say, what well, Allah had hummed, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years ago, when I first started studying, becoming interested in Islam, and going overseas, I'm still riding off of that first taste from back then. So the last final thought is our responsibility, speaking to myself firstly, is to provide a good example and be good role models for the Shabab. 
And I said this in this masjid earlier today or yesterday in the other maracas, the other centers, is that I have not come to you to talk about going to college and playing basketball and being a good youth in Islam. That's not my agenda. My agenda is to encourage as many people as we possibly can to seek ilm. And the best of that ilm, the most blessed of that ilm, without a doubt, is the ilm of the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, his sunnah. Whereas his sunnah was the interpretation, was the explanation, was the living tafsir of the Qur'an al-Kareem. And the Prophet sallallahu has told us, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ The best of you those who learn the Qur'an and teach it to others. And from learning the Qur'an is much more than just memorizing it. And there lies no doubt, the best way of learning the Qur'an is what Aisha radiallahu anha has said, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ Quran. The Prophet Sussan's character was the Qur'an. So if you want to understand the Qur'an and learn it, there lies no doubt. The first place is the Sunnah of the Prophet Sussan. I ask Allah by His beautiful names and perfect attributes to bless us all, to have mercy upon our souls, and forgive us of our sins. Thank you very much for the opportunity and the invitation. And Wallah al it is my honor to be here standing in front of you. Jazakum Allahu Khairan.